Good morning, and welcome to New York City Council Finance Committee hearing on the Mayor's preliminary budget for FY 2014. My name is Dominic M. Recchia, Jr., and I'm the chair of this wonderful committee. I welcome everyone to City Hall, and I especially want to recognize from CUNY uh, the students from the new community college. Welcome to the uh, preliminary budget hearing. I hope you find it very interesting. And you will hear shortly from Mr. Mark Page, the wonderful budget director for the, the Bloomberg administration. Before we get started, I'd like to recognize all of my colleagues. Um, we want to recognize the deputy director, Jeffrey Rodas, making sure everything's okay. You might want to take Mr. Page's coat. He's sitting on his coat. <laughs> Uh, we've also been joined by Mark Weprin, Councilmember Weprin, Councilmember Alvan, Councilmember Robert Jackson, Councilmember Melissa Mark Favorito, uh, Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, and, and I have everyone. Uh, there's other hearings going on. Council members will be coming in and out. I, if any council member would like to ask a question, please send me your name to my wonderful attorney sitting to my right, Tanisha Edwards. Um, I want to take a quick moment before we get started to thank the entire City Council Finance Division under the leadership of Preston Niblack and Jeffrey Rodas and the deputies Latan McKinney, Regina Parada, Ryan, Nathan Toth, Scott Crowley, Chief Economist Ray Majewski, and of course my wonderful counsel Tanisha Edwards. They always work very hard and they have worked around the clock preparing for today's hearing. Please give them a round of applause. I also want to thank my personal staff, Migna, Kenny, and uh, Ashley, because uh, they've been working very, very hard uh, in preparing for today. Now, with that said, let's get down to business. Give them a round of applause, too. Okay. The preliminary budget hearing marks the beginning of the Council's role in the annual budget adoption process. On June 28, 2012, the Council adopted FY 2013 budget, which totaled $68.5 billion. Through precedent budget, a prudent budget in, in collaboration with the administration, we were able to accomplish a lot of great things. Libraries were able to remain open for five days a week. Daycare and after school programs were restored at or above the FY12 levels. The council prevented the closure of any fire companies and protected senior services. In education, the council reached an agreement with the Department of Education to avoid a reduction in school aids and restored funding to help teachers buy necessary materials for their classroom, also known as Teacher's Choice. Many accomplishments were made and we should be very proud. But as the saying goes, it's that time of the year again. Back in November, Mayor Bloomberg released his November financial plan, which included a $1.5 billion peg a program to help close the FY14 budget gap, which was projected at that time to be $2.5 billion. Two months later, on January 29th, the mayor presented his preliminary budget, also termed the January plan for FY2014. In terms of the city's overall financial outlook, the financial plan contains some encouraging news. Our revenue growth is starting to pick up. Our expense growth rate is slowing, mostly because of Medicaid and pension costs and the projected out-year gaps are the lowest percentage of city funds they have seen since uh, 2008. While the long-term outlook is encouraging and shows the results of the hard work we have all done over the last five budgets, there are still several significant risks in the short term and many open-ended questions. Obviously, one of the biggest unknowns is the outcome of the pending court case regarding the city's taxi plan and the fate of the nearly $1.5 billion in revenue expected from the sale of 2,000 taxi medallions. Another major item is, of course, Superstorm Sandy, from which many New Yorkers are still trying to recover. OMB estimates Sandy will cost the city $4.5 billion in FY14. Of these costs, $1.4 billion will support emergency work involving debris re removal and emergency protective me measures, which will be included in the expense budget. While the balance will be incurred over time in capital budget, OMB is expecting federal funding to cover these costs. Today, we will ask the budget director how the federal claims and reimbursement process is going and what 
his expectations are regarding this process. We would also like to hear about planning for the use of other federal funds that were part of the Federal Disaster Relief Package. Another major concern is the federal sequestration. The Budget Control Act of 2011 created a set of federal budget targets and dates for achieving those targets. If these targets are not reached by certain dates, then a set of automatic budget cuts known as sequestration will take place. These cuts will affect funds that have not yet been dispersed. The first sequestration began this past Friday, March 1st. If the sequestration lasts a full federal fiscal year, federal discretionary money could be cut by $26 billion. This means a 9% cut in spending in areas such as housing, education, and social services for the rest of the federal fiscal year, which ends September 30th. Full implementation of the sequestration would reduce federal categorical aid to the city by over $300 million in such critical areas as housing, education, child care, job training, and public safety. These cuts will most certainly impede the city's economic growth and unfortunately will likely have an adverse effect on the unemployment rate. In addition, disaster funding for New York City for Superstorm Sandy could also be cut by as much as $500 million, leaving the city holding the bag for tens of millions of dollars in unreimbursed emergency expenses and threatening our efforts to rebuild our communities. Finally, as usual, despite the clear importance of the Council attaches to certain areas of spending as shown by our consistent rest, uh, restorations, none of them have been funded in the Mayor's budget. These include funding for fire companies, libraries, child care, after school programs, and many others. What this all means, we have a lot of work to do. Like I said before, it's that time of year again. Today we'll hear from the Director of Office of Management and Budget, Mr. Mark Page, and his staff to learn more about his projections, assumptions, revenue actions, and thoughts on the sequestration and the delayed sale of taxi medallions. After we hear from Mr. Page, we'll hear from the Department of Finance, the Department of Design and Construction, the New York City Controller, then finally the Independent Budget Office. Then we will hear from the public session. We'll begin today at approximately 4 p.m. For the entire month of March, the Council, through appropriate committees, will hear from agency commissioners. If we could please have quiet, please keep your conversations down. If you need them, take them outside. Uh, through the appropriate committees, we'll hear from agency commissioners who can be asked specific questions related to the agency. Since we'll hear from agency commissioners, I want to remind my colleagues that Mark Page is here to answer questions relating to the financial health of cities, the effect of federal and state actions on the city's budget, and the priorities, methodologies, and factors considered in preparing the city's budget. Please reserve agency-specific questions for those commissioners. After the preliminary budget hearings, the Council will prepare its official response to the Mayor's preliminary budget, which is due on April 12th. We hope that our response will significantly influence the executive budget, which is due by April 26. At that time, we will have another set of executive budget hearings during the month of May, and then we will have, uh, we will put our response out and start negotiating with the mayor and his staff. We'll now hear from the director of the mayor's office of management and budget, but before we let Mr. Page speak, I believe some more members have come in. We have been joined by Councilmember Landa, okay, and Councilmember Mealy. All right, Mr. Page, welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, and we also been joined by Oliver Coppell. Um, I'm Mark Page, the Director of Management and Budget. To my left are. If you could move the microphone down a little bit. I'm Mark Page, Director of Management and Budget. Uh, to my left are two deputies in the Office of Management and Budget, Ray Orlando and John Grathwell. Um, I would like to speak for a few minutes um, in general, but uh, look forward to doing my best to respond to your questions for the bulk of the time this morning. As usual, uh, things don't stand still. 
we published the uh, mayor's uh, preliminary budget and modified the financial plan in uh, late January. Uh, since then, um, the city's actuary in his usual painstaking calculation process as to what our actual uh, payment will be required to be this year and next has made some additional progress and notified us that over the two years 13 and 14 uh, we will owe the pension systems another 250 million dollars spread more or less but evenly between um, those two years as uh, you're all uh, very aware uh, federal sequestration um, has now technically begun it's not that easy to determine the immediate consequence to uh, specific city services but the uh, percentage reductions of the flow of federal aid to the many programs that are supported from that source um, will inevitably um, have a significant impact on the level of service we are able to provide uh, as time passes. Um, I think we're all a little bit um, uncertain as to at the end of the day what exact form is going to stick in terms of uh, adjustment of federal support of local services. In addition to that problem, um, as I think you're all very aware, in January we included um, a, an expected revenue in fiscal year 14 of $600 million from the proposed sale of additional taxi medallions in New York City. Um, as I'm sure you all know, the state authorizing legislation for that transaction has been challenged in court. The Court of Appeals has now uh, accepted jurisdiction directly from the Supreme Court. The argument date is scheduled for April 23rd. Uh, we're left in a sort of state of uncertainty as to exactly how to, at least I am, to deal with this topic. Um, the mayor's uh, executive budget is due at the end of April. Um, the problem with our circumstance on this transaction, or one of the major one, is that both the timing and the nature of the Court of Appeals decision on the um, authorizing legislation for this transaction is going to be unknown uh, certainly at the end of April. Um, I, it's going to be very interesting to see whether we have a decision by the end of June when we're obliged to have a budget in place for the year beginning uh, July 1st. I guess that obviously there are another, a number of other ongoing issues, but I think that um, I'll stop there and uh, look forward to your questions. Okay. Um, I'm going to start off, Mr. Page, just by asking you a few questions to start off with. Then I'm going to give, turn it over to my colleagues. Everyone will be giving five minutes. And then if you want to ask more questions, you, you can stay around and we'll uh, have a second round. Um, the city has experienced another year of strong employment growth, adding 74,000 jobs in total payroll in 2012 compared to 2011. OMB has project, projected a sharp reduction in, an, in employment growth of only 41,000 new jobs in 2013. Discuss, uh, explain to me why there's a sharp decline in job growth expected this year. I, I the job growth so far has actually, in the city, has actually been somewhat stronger than I think we 
originally expected and uh, I think that these things usually the trends aren't perfectly steady I think that uh, we have actually done better on jobs than the rest of the country um, through the recession that we seem to be slowly climbing out of and, and the recent period I think that we feel that inevitably um, although we've managed to push ahead of the national trend we are part of the national economy and we're likely to come back to a, a rate more in line with the rest of the country in terms of our economic growth and jobs growth um, as we go along here. Because a great concern is the unemployment rate. Our unemployment rate is like 8.8 percent, way above the national average. And uh, in the last year, we've been going, you know, our unemployment rate has been increasing, you know, and with sequestration at this point, what effect, you know, do you think sequestration will have on the city's unemployment rate? I mean, the, the, the obvious answer is that I don't really know. I mean, there's, there's a general sense that reducing uh, federal spending has a negative effect on, econo on the economy, the national economy. I mean, presumably the same thing is true to a degree here. Um, the actual flow through of federal funding is for various reasons um, pretty lagged in terms of the services that New York City provides. Um, I'm sure there are some cases in which this change is going to have an effect in fiscal year 13 but I wouldn't actually ex expect a lot frankly in terms of the change in federal numbers uh, 14 uh, will begin to feel an effect uh, the overall city economy I don't have the number four but it's huge and the number that we're talking about in reduced spending because of reduced spending of federal money in terms of the overall city economy is not huge um, it it is significant in terms of the services it pays for. As we sit here, you know, this whole issue of sequestration, how it's going to affect the city, you know, we hear it all every day, we hear it all the time, but we really have to look out for the uh, unemployment rate. It's a great concern to the city council and figure out what we could do to bring it down. This is, you know, uh, something that we have to keep an eye on. Um, I just want to follow. It's just the, this question of the unemployment rate. It's, it's obviously a, a number that we're all extremely concerned about. Right. It, on the other hand, it is a number that is derived from a sample bunch of phone calls to households, um, and I understand. It, it, it's not. It we we. Um, and I understand. It, it, it's not. It, we we the, the jobs numbers. We actually count the number of jobs. jobs. We think that's pretty good. Pretty good data, and we've been doing pretty well on that score. Right. The unemployment rate is, among other things, if I'm sitting at home and I get this phone call and I've had it, I haven't looked for a job for the last three months because I spent the previous. 12 months looking for one and got nowhere. If I say I'm not looking for a job because I've just given up, I'm not in that number. If I actually think that there's hope for me getting back into the workforce, I say I'm looking for a job and I'm counted in that unemployment percent. I'm not saying it's something to ignore by any means, but it's, it's one indication of what's going on along with a bunch of others that we look at. I hear what you're saying, Mr. Page, but if you speak to different economists across the city, they all say with the sequestration, the area that, that will get hit the hardest is job growth, will be growth. And that is a problem and what we're looking at for the future. 
and this is why it's a great concern to us. It's something we will talk further, but lots of you know questions. I just have a uh, uh, um, a pension question for you. Um, you know, um, you said that the actuary raised the FY14 and 15 pension contributions to 250 million. He, no, raised them by, I think it's like 130 one of the years and 170 the other. I'm sorry, I'm sorry 130 and 120, and it's 130 in... Uh, it's a total 13. of 250? It's a total of 250 over the two years. So FY14 is what? It's gone up by 120, and, and 13 is up 130. And why was that raised? You know, the base number that we contribute for pensions is something in the neighborhood of $8 billion. And the city actuary spends months and months calculating the exact number for each year. I mean, we go in with a budget at the beginning of the year, which is based on, among other things, extensive discussions between my office and his. Um, inevitably, every year, um, as he gets into the fine grind, the number changes somewhat, and uh, that's happening again this year, and it so happens that it's going up. Okay. Um, you're aware of the Early Learn program, and there's been a reduction of about 1,500 daycare workers covered by uh, Cyrus Pension. The reduction creates an employer withdrawal liability of about $63.8 million to the pension system since those employees are guaranteed pension benefits under the ERISA laws. Until this year, the city has always contributed pension costs for those employees directly to Cyrus Pension System. Will the city fund those costs of that employer liability? I don't believe that that is, in fact, our obligation. It that pension system is not, it's not a city pension system. It's actually a private pension system that a bunch of contractors, many of which do business, you know, provide service for New York City under contracts, have enrolled their employees in as part of their compensation package for the employees. As a matter of administrative convenience, the city has paid as part of its contract compensation to those enterprises what the enterprise owes to this private pension system on behalf of those of its employees that our money supports. It's, it's basically, you know, it's part of the compensation package that an employee of another company, not New York City, gets from that company. If we're no longer doing business with that company and we're no longer on a contract with them, we have no obligation to continue to pay the cost of a benefit that that company has given to one of its employees. Last year, when we negotiated this whole early learn proposal, we brought this up. We were constantly told, don't worry about it, it's all going to work out. You know, and because the city doesn't want to fund this liability, and it shifted to the daycares and to the cultural organizations, okay, the cultural organizations are getting hit big time because it's increasing their costs. Um, I, I don't think you know, and this is a problem that no one is addressing right now. And you know, the city helped out in the past, and now all of a sudden it says we're no longer responsible, and we're leaving thousands of people out there. And we have a real serious problem with this pension system. You know, as in other circumstances, we. The city can choose to pay for what it chooses to pay for within uh, bounds of, of what is a uh, public um, purpose. It's not clear at this moment uh, what the 
number is that under ERISA if you have a company that goes out of business and so it stops paying the pension contribution for its employees who were enrolled and were currently being paid by and were being currently supported in their pensions by that company. The company stops. Other companies that continue to have employees who are members of that particular pension enterprise um, share the cost dropped by the one that went out of business. I'd, as far as I know, we have no grip at all on what number that cost is in that private pension system or ultimately what effect it's actually going to have on enterprises that continue to have their employees enrolled in that particular pension system. I, I, there is a possible point here, but we don't. But it's way early to get upset. I think about well, the cultural institutions that continue to have employees for whom they pay for pensions through this system. And this is the issue when they were changing early learn last year. We brought this whole pension issue up. No one wanted to address it. What's going to happen is that this pension fund is going to be hit so bad and if we don't do something about it now it could affect people's pensions of the future in addition to that you know Cyrus has pension they built for the 2012 and 2013 and the city has not paid any part of that bill will the city pay for the bill for its past obligation do you have any intentions on paying for it? Where do we stand with that? We have a problem. We have a number of problems with this enterprise. One of them is that we, we have in our contracts with various cultural enterprises and various child care enterprises agreed that as a part of the compensation on our contract with that entity, we would pay what that entity owes to this private pension company. As we've looked back at the history on that, it turns out that the information we were given by a substantial number of the enterprises we have those contracts with about what they owed that we were responsible for has not been true that they basically told us that we, had, we were responsible for benefits, not just for the employees who are working for New York City, but responsible for benefits for employees who are working for somebody else. And there's a bunch of money that we've paid over the years that has been, I guess, nice for those enterprises but not very nice for our taxpayers and what we've actually gotten for our money. There's, I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of open questions here that we need to figure out. Right, and I think we need to have a meeting on this because uh, this is really going to hurt a lot of people. But before I move on to my colleagues, I just have you said, uh, that you learned certain information was not true. The information that you learned that was not true, was that from the daycare or from the cultural institutions? We have better information on what's true and not true about the cultural institutions, and we have, at this point, have not gotten much information that appears to be reliable on the daycare side. Okay. So the daycare, you don't have enough data. Is that what you're saying? To I don't think we really know what's going on, quite honestly. And we're, it's not for lack of asking. At this no, point. I know. I Listen. Think, I think we'll get there at some right. point. But right. it's, I'm going to move on to this, but mess. we really need to set up a meeting with this. That's fine. Okay, with your staff and 
our staff and see what we could do to I'd be happy to do that. Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm going to give every council member five minutes. If you'd like to ask a second question after your five minutes, then you go on list number two. But before we move forward, I'd like to recognize those members who have joined us. Councilmember Koslowitz, Councilmember Gonzalez, Councilmember Reyna, Councilmember Jamani Williams, and Councilmember Rosie Mendez, and Councilmember Liz Crowley. Okay? All right. The first member is going to be Jimmy Van Bramer, followed by Councilmember Jackson. Five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. Good morning, Mr. Chair. I've got to correct that. It's Councilmember Van Bramer, then Councilmember Melissa Mark Riverito, then Jackson. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, the fourth time that uh, you've been uh, uh, before this committee as I've been the Chair of Cultural Affairs and Libraries. Um, and uh, it could be your, your last uh, uh, as the Budget Director. And you may be aware of this, but I wanted to make sure that I said this on the record because I think it's staggering. Uh, the four proposed budgets that this administration has come forward with has called for $575 million in cuts to cultural affairs and libraries. That's almost $600 million that you've come to the council uh, asking to cut from cultural affairs and libraries. And as this administration prepares uh, to exit and thinks about its legacy, I think of education, tourism, and jobs as three keystones to the legacy of Mayor Bloomberg. There is no way that cutting these institutions at that level uh, speaks well uh, to that legacy or is a, a legacy that you could be proud of. I want to ask you, is, deep, is destabilizing and devastating uh, our cultural institutions and libraries something that you think is good for the city of New York? No. I would note that the budgets that together we have uh, put together for New York City over the four years of your tenure and consider considerably longer than that have not um, in fact uh, treated resources for cultures and libraries um, along the lines of the numbers you mentioned. I, that's correct, uh, but uh, let me just go back to your answer. I asked you if, if destabilizing and devastating cultures and libraries was good for the city of New York. You said no, and yet we continue this budget dance which has that exact effect on the institutions which are so key to education, tourism, and jobs, which are three keystones of the Bloomberg uh, agenda. So, yes, we have restored something in the neighborhood of $500 million uh, in cuts to libraries and culturals uh, in the four years uh, that I've been here. And I worked for libraries before I got elected, so I'm very aware of the history. Uh, this is my 15th year uh, being invested in libraries and culturals. But the only way out of this, because even with restorations, as you know, Mr. Page, there is a chipping away effect that is crippling our cultures and libraries. The only way out, would you not agree, the only way to stabilize these critical sectors is to baseline funding for culturals and libraries. Would you agree that we should baseline as a way of finding a way to stabilize funding for cultures and libraries? We have to baseline. Given the overall context of the negotiation of city budgets each year and the roles taken by the various parties, um, although that might be desirable, for those agencies, um, I do not actually believe that what you suggest is practical. 
Let me just suggest that it's not just desirable for the agencies or the institutions, it's desirable for the city of New York. I think you would agree, and certainly Mayor Bloomberg has made a very strong case, that the reason we have 52 million tourists generating hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue is because our culturals are as strong as they are and as welcoming as they are, and indeed, they are part of what will be the recovery post-Sandy if we destabilize our cultural institutions, we destabilize New York City, baselining them is not just good for culturals or the DCA, it's good for the city of New York. And we can and we should baseline, and I hope uh, uh, that we can do that. Uh, Chairman Recchia mentioned unemployment. The cuts that you have proposed alone for this year, this year alone, over $100 million for libraries, $106 million cut proposed to our three library systems, nearly $65 million to culturals, uh, and uh, $40 million to our cultural institution group members. That would result in thousands of layoffs for employees of these institutions. Are those layoffs good for the city of New York? I, I would observe that uh, thus far um, we have avoided layoffs in those agencies this year. Um, layoffs um, sometimes are necessary for the city of New York. Um, I don't know that those layoffs are actually likely to happen given what we have both observed in terms of the um, at least past budget practice in terms of the tr ultimate treatment of resources for these purposes. I, I know I have to go, but I just want to say if you're a librarian in Red Hook or a cultural employee in Harlem, the truth is that this process calls for them to lose their jobs. There is a human dimension and a human element. They don't have to care about the budget dance. They're on the hook to lose their job. We should stop doing this. We can do better, Mr. Page, and I hope with your help. We will. The truth is those layoffs have been avoided because of this council, Speaker Quinn, Chairman Recchia, and all of us here together. That's why we've avoided layoffs. That's why we've kept our culture and libraries afloat. We've got to do better for our cultures and libraries. Thank you. I, Thank you, I, I would Mark. say that it's not a unilateral act either by the council or the administration. I think they've been avoided as a joint effort. Uh, joint <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Um, you know, I love it. Sometimes it's a joint venture, joint effort. Other times it's uh, unilateral. You know, Barely. You know. Okay. We're going to remember that. You hear that, Jimmy? So yeah. We're going to remember it. Okay. We've been joined by Leroy Comrie. And uh, that's it. Melissa Mark, followed by Jackson, Councilmember Jackson, Councilmember Melissa Mark, for detail. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And <clears throat> I have some specific questions, particularly re relating to Sandy and um, reimbursement from the feds. But I think just you know, going on that vein of of this being possibly the last hearing that we'll interact with you, Mr. Page, and really reflecting back on you know the legacy of this administration. Uh, you know, what I see is a a very dire scene for the working class and the working poor in the city. We have historic homeless numbers in the city of New York at 50,000. We have 28% of our children living in poverty in New York City. We have 20% of adults living in poverty in New York City. We've seen a devastation of the child care system, so working parents have more of a harder time being able to go to work and have a safe place for their kids to be. Uh, we see the expanding growth of low-wage jobs that really make it difficult for people to continue to live in this city uh, with no benefits. That's the legacy of this administration, the whittling away of the middle class, uh, the income gap that is the greatest in the nation. That's the scenari scenario that I see. That's the landscape that I see for New York City, which is very troubling for me. I believe there has been a true lack of leadership and vision of really looking at all options and, and, and scenarios on the table on how we can make this a livable city for the vast majority of us. And you kind of have difficulty looking at me in the eye and 
I guess, addressing this issue. So I don't actually. I know, I know, because you probably think that talking. I'm just talking to the air, and you probably think if, that if, I am, what I'm saying is invalid. I think it's very valid. You, why, why would you think if that? If I could finish, Mr. Page. You're supposed to be asking I, me questions, and I, will, I thought, and as I will, opposed to making a and statement, and I'd love to make a okay, statement in right. return. Because this is, very, this is, to me, this is very frustrating, and it's very sad, because this is the reality of the constituents that I represent. This is the reality that is lived every day in the community that it I represent. It is a part of the reality and of so the constituents you represent. Unfortunately, you know, okay. uh, there's, there, let me just get Let's to... Let's ask questions dealing yes, with the budget. Yes, I will. Um, you know, and unfortunately, what, what we see is, is, uh, is a spin machine trying to make it seem like this mayor is such a maverick and a reformer at a national level, but we sc scratch below the surface, and the reality is the one that I've laid out for the vast majority in the city. Mm. So looking at specifically, because this is something that's been of concern to me, is the reimbursement of Sandy-related expenses. Um, do we, we had a hearing last week where some of the agencies, Department of Sanitation, Department of Parks, have indicated that there's ongoing expenses that, that, they're, they're, uh, that they're taking into account now that I'm not sure if they were originally factored in the equation. Of the amount that was submitted to the federal government for reimbursement, how much would you say has been provided in the allocations that have been approved, one, and two, how much has Sandy, in terms of the expenses, contributed to the deficit of, of the budget for this year, for instance, or if you're projecting it's going to add to the deficit for next year? I'd like to respond to your first question having to do with this administration and the people who you believe are your constituents. Well, I believe there I'm are eight and a half million people who live here, many of whom are exactly as you describe, many less so. I think the basic problem that we have as a city, and I share your concern on the issues that you've raised, is where do you get the resources to enable you to address the problems that are evident when you look around in terms of how many people live here? And at the end of the day, it would be nice to get more money from the federal government. It would be nice to get more money from the state. I mean, both of those issues are extremely problematic politically. And then we look at our own tax base. And you can, you know, economically you can raise taxes or lower taxes. You raise them and, and you figure you'll get more money. And that's true up to a point as long as the people and companies and whoever who make the money and are subject to our tax jurisdiction stay here and quite honestly they need to do well. And there's unfortunately a sort of two-way balance that you're responsible for along with everybody else in terms of how do you run the place in a way that will give you the resources to do what you would like to for many people who need help. And I think that you have to look at both sides of that equation as you judge this administration, not just well, one. Well, Mr. Page, let me but ask you a question. Would it be better for the tax base of New York City if we had a more vibrant middle class? As opposed to, because we've how do you, seen but how do you, the how do you, of the middle how class do you, how do you get a more vibrant jobs. middle class? S sir. There has been a dwindling of the middle class. Maybe that's true, and but that, why? And I think a vi more vibrant middle class obviously will be better for, a be for the tax base of New York City. Now, with the economic subsidies that this administration has been giving away to corporations, what we've been getting in return are low-wage jobs. There needs to be more leadership that the expectation of the investment of our taxpayer dollars is going to produce more for the city of New York. There has been a lack I, I, of leadership on that front. I think, okay. the, I think greater wealth for the well, entire population of New York City, including the middle class, but I guess I'll get to that in the second round. Right. Thank you. All right. Mr. Page, you want to say anything else? You want to move on? If, 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 I, if you want me to answer the uh, Sandy questions, I will. I don't yeah, know. Answer, yes, answer the Sandy question. Okay. The, um, the $4.5 billion estimate that we've been carrying in terms of damage incurred by city agencies, we think encompasses um, the ongoing spending that we're finding necessary. Um, 
as in any budget, it's obviously a, the best forecast you can do in terms of what's actually going to happen because, you know, something's broken. Until you actually get in and can spend the time looking at it, particularly for major uh, sort of capital reconstruction, it's very hard to know how much it's going to cost. I mean, you have to get into it, see what's wrong, scope out the work, get bids, sign the contracts, it's an ongoing process and it's going to take a long time, quite honestly. It's going to take years to do. In terms of where we are with the uh, FEMA process with the Feds, we've actually managed to, of that four and a half billion dollars, we've got, um, as of a few days ago, 577 million dollars worth of identified work that they have detailed, put into, um, PW stands for, pod project worksheets, which is the sort of nitty detailed units that FEMA accepts. Um, of that 577, they've agreed to reimburse us for $322 million, and we've actually received at this point 238. Some of that stuff is because under the current FEMA reimbursement, they're 75%, not, not 100. We're expecting the 75 to go to 90 when this region gets over 2.6 billion. 2.6 billion in damages that FEMA has accepted. They've got to get there. We think they'll get there in the next few months, basically. But then, for things like debris removal, when we spent the money, it's gone, the junk's gone, you can put in the whole claim and they'll give it to you when it grinds through all their gears. Um, for a capital job, they kind of agree on the capital job and then when you get the cost fully identified, they might pay you half of what they think they owe you, which right now is only three quarters, and then it has to be finished before they'll pay you the other half. So there's a long timeline in here. As of this moment, we have that four and a half billion dollars. That's being carried in terms of the city's budget by an expectation that it's going to get paid for by the feds at the end of the day. So that as of this moment, we have not cut city spending for anything else as a result of what we obviously have to spend and fix for FEMA not sorry, for Sandy consequence. How that's going to hold on at the end of the day, quite honestly, I don't really know. I mean, there's, you have to get FEMA um, approval of each unit that you're doing, and then assuming you can get that, this 25 percent or maybe it gets down to 10, there's a certain amount of uh, community development block grant money that has been appropriated to us and some of that we're hoping, I certainly am, to use to cover the shortage on the FEMA coverage of what we need for fixing things. Um, CDBG... You mean that 10%? Yeah, the 10 percent, or maybe they reject something entirely because it doesn't fit in one of their standards. But yes, the 10 percent, the trouble is, they've been, we've gotten a little bit more flexibility on CDBG than we would normally have, but you have to cram the 10 percent through another set of requirements on the federal money in order to qualify for the CDBG reimbursement. It's early days in that process right now, but that too is going to take us, I mean, it's probably, you know, it's going to be years before it's really sorted out. That's so what I was going to ask, yeah. how many fiscal years are you projecting? That, I mean, you're talking about 4.5 billion initially, and so far, 322 million has been allocated. That I mean, that's that that four and a half billion dollars is going to take years. Mm -hmm. At the, uh, the about a billion six of it, I think, is expense budget. Billion four, I'm sorry. Um, and that should run through, I would think, this year, next year, mostly. And hopefully, we'll get the reimbursement on it. But the rest of it's capital, and it's going to take years. So you're saying that within the expense, within the next two fiscal years? 
Mm. I, I would think the bulk of it, 13, 14, maybe some slop over into 15, but the, the capital one is, Much longer. it's, it just, it's going to take time. I mean, 9-11 took us another, probably took us a decade to sort through all the details and the loose ends and threads on federal reimbursement for that damage. Mm -hmm. And the bulk of it didn't take that long, but you, you know, it just, this, it's a very bureaucratic, nitty, detailed process. Thank you for your right. answer, Mr. Page. Mr. Page, you said it's going to take years. Are you going to be around? <laughs> okay, Councilmember Jackson. Come on, you have to laugh. <laughs> Take a deep breath. <laughs> yeah. Councilmember well, Jackson. Well, thank you and good morning, everyone. <clears throat> uh, Director Page, let me ask you some questions regarding education. The executive budget proposed to cut funding of about $250 million because the agreement was not reached between the parties. And in fact, as you know, uh, Mike Rebell, our attorney, we got a preliminary injunction against the state of New York from holding back that money, but I was shocked shocked, literally, that the city has communicated with our attorney that you are going forward with the cuts. Was that a decision made by you, and were you consulted with that? Because the impact on our children will be devastating. Yes. Not so much, I don't think. Um, <clears throat> the problem with that um, injunction, given the way New York City's finances work, I mean, if, if our problem in spending the $250 million for education in this year was that we just don't have the cash in the wallet, um, the injunction would, would I guess, would, would address that. Our problem is that at the end of the day, in order to spend money in 13, we have to have a revenue to cover, with it, cover it with in order to get out of the year balanced. And just by making the state push the money through, if by the time this thing wends its way through the appeals process in the courts, which it is, I think, clearly going to, we eventually lose the right to the money. If it's spent, we don't have it. We have a deficit of $250 million. I wouldn't for a minute say that $250 million isn't important to us. Um, you know, it buys a lot of things. I think that as we lined out how we could hold back on that amount of money in the Department of Education in the second half of the year. It's clearly not great, but I think that we found a significant amount of overfunding, revenues we hadn't rec recognized yet, um, a certain amount of savings centrally, and I think that we managed to hold the impact on schools, I, I certainly wouldn't say there's none, but I think we managed to hold it down as best we could. Ultimately, if we get the $250 million, it'll go into education and it will certainly get spent. But at this moment, I don't believe that responsibly we can spend the money without the balance question um, being able to be answered. Okay. Now, and, and I heard your explanation. Um, if, you've, if you read the decision, the Supreme Court Justice indicated that all indications based on the hearing that we will win this particular case. And, and I say to you that I know that $250 million is a lot of money, but when you're talking about the Department of Education that has a budget, an expense budget of about $23 billion, right. you, no one can tell me you can't juggle like they've done on a continuous basis. I'll just say that. I've ju that. That's what we did, quite honestly, to cover the 250 in their budget this year. But the, uh, and Director Page, I'm saying to you and to everyone, not only you, the impact, as Mayor Bloomberg had indicated in his State of the City address, as a result of that 
agreement not being reached, after-school programs, anti-bullying programs that are being implemented are going to be cut, pre-K, we're not going to hire over 700 teachers, that will have such a devastating impact on the children of New York City, which cannot be recovered once they lose that opportunity. I, so. I, I, I would be, I, I think I, I could um, spend a few minutes at your convenience taking you through how much of the 250 is that kind of impact and how much of it isn't, in fact. Okay. Um, I would like to do that. Maybe. We're obviously in a, in a very difficult place because clearly that $250 million and the ongoing impact of it is extremely important to us. Absolutely. And the outcome on that is a political question between us and what goes on in the state legislature. Could be a political question. It could be, a, it's a legal question because the, the, our decision in the campaign for fiscal equity is not being adhered to. And that's why our attorney is in court. Now you can, and I understand the, the political situation up in Albany, do you know what I mean? I'm not yeah. naive to that, Director Page. Yeah. But I'm saying to you that the bottom line though, if it's not dealt with politically, then we have to pursue it legally like we've done before in order to fight for our children. And I just think uh, that... Uh, I, 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 I totally get it. I think that, you know, and the decision of, the, of this judge in the New York Supreme Court is fine. If that were the ultimate decision, we'd have clear sailing here. Um, as we know, the uh, court process in our fine state is less clear on its ultimate outcomes than often the, the first address in the, in the Supreme Court is. I'm certainly hoping that's true on the taxi medallions the other way, quite honestly. So, and I know my time is up, but could you just tell me what the number is, if you know, the impact on education in New York City as a result of the sequestration? Uh, Sixty-some million dollars would be our estimate right now. I'm sorry, how much? Sixty-some million dollars would be our estimate right now. Okay. Okay. And that would be for fiscal... 13-14. 13-14. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Cabrera, we followed by Councilmember Landa. If any Councilmember would like to ask questions, please submit your name to Tanisha Edwards. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to make sure I get uh, my numbers right. I, I just want to follow up with Councilmember Jackson's uh, questions regarding uh, the $250 million. Are, are we looking to lose about 700 teachers uh, through attrition uh, this year and 1,800 teachers next year? I think that a, a part of how we were going to deal with the loss of the 250 this year was um, that we wouldn't backfill attrition that takes place as an ongoing matter in the remainder of this year. And um, the 250, if you translate the numbers into um, how many heads they'll pay for, it translates into, and I, I don't remember the 1800 number, but I expect you're right. Um, you know, what actually happens in terms of education funding for next year? Uh, there's a legislative session to, give, to get through. Um, we obviously have this uh, legal approach to the 250 in this school year. Um, I guess I, I would at least hope that whether um, through the courts or, or the legislature or something, this uh, proposal that takes away the 250 and then takes it away forever, 
mm. um, at least is, is it, would, it would be nice if it went away entirely, clearly, but this idea that it stays around forever, um, I can't deal with. I, that can't be the ultimate result here, I would say, frankly. I don't, uh, I don't know how we get there from here, but... Uh, my main concern, I just have one more question, I'll be quick and then turn the clock on. So I guess I got an extra five minutes. That's great. No, I'll be f very fair, Mr. Chair. Uh, my, my main concern is, uh, as you know, we are out of compliance with the state courts in, in terms of class size. And I, think, I believe these numbers uh, will further impact our current situation. Let me ask you a real broad question. I, I think you had addressed a lot of this, but I, I just want to kind of put the dots together here. If we were to lose, if the administration were to lose, and I support the administration on the delivery case, uh, sequestration continues as it is. Let's say FEMA continues to drag its feet like it normally does. What kind of impact I, do you foresee we're going to see this year and next year? If worst case scenario, give us a worst case scenario situation. I, 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 can never, I can never put finite bounds on the worst case or the best case. Things happen that surprise me all the time. I don't believe that we have a big exposure on the four and a half billion dollars this year. Famous last words, I mean, we're going to get to a point where we have to recognize that we can't backfill the fragments with other federal money where FEMA doesn't cover. I don't know. But Yes, it's four and a half billion, but we haven't spent anything like four and a half billion dollars ourselves yet. It's, it's an evolving thing. I don't think that's a big deal. Sequestration in this year, I mean, it may hit us to, to some degree, but I think that given the delays in how the feds fund services that we actually provide, I don't think that that's such a big deal. I mean, obviously, I mean, you're, you're always worried about um, cuts, cuts in Medicaid. I think that uh, we have a serious problem here in terms of HHC's lost revenue for having um, facilities shut and uh, continuing expenses for those facilities and HHC is tight to begin with. Um, I, I, I'm I think that we're, things are not necessarily breaking our way if um, the economy does a little better than we expect. Um, so marginally uh, taxes improve. Uh, that would certainly be helpful over the next few months. I think that things are tight. It's not looking disastrous. And a worst case, I can't identify. I, I imagine almost anything that happens something else could happen to make it worse. But that's not sort of where I would expect us to end up here. Mr. Preach, one last quick, quick question is, uh, what impact um, sequestration uh, would have, uh, would affect in terms of what is reimbursable? Reimbursable and on FEMA? I mean, at the whole federal, that four and a half? Um, we're saying that... On everything else, please. As, as we run the federal percent that they're cutting in sequestration on the, on the four and a half, it's about $500 million. On everything else, um, the percent that they're running as of now are a little bit less than what they were saying last week. Um, so... We're probably in the neighborhood of $200 million, we would say, a little less than that in our guess, over 13 and 14. Uh, the grand total of operating budget type services, Sandy, um, HHC, Medicare, NYCHA, um, our current estimate is somewhere in the neighborhood of $800 million as a result of where the sequestration is right now. That's actually a little lower than it was last week because of the percentages that the feds actually ran when they did this over the weekend. I, it's very hard to know 
how this is going to play through, and I guess we would continue to hope that notwithstanding the lack of judgment in, um, I'm sorry, not judgment, well, well, maybe it's judgment. I mean, when the feds are cutting, are they actually applying judgment or are they actually, or are they just running a formula? We would hope that sooner or later they'll actually ap apply judgment and this program is not ultimately what we're going to live with. Do I know that that's true? I have no idea. Thank you so much. Okay. Councilmember Landa, followed by Councilmember Coppell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Budget Director. Good to see you. Uh, let me follow up on this question just a, a little bit, and I understand that, you know, in many ways we all feel in the dark and puzzled by how Washington is is acting, and that your job is to figure out how to how to bring that to the ground in the city's uh -huh. budget. But to the extent that there are reimbursable items that are hit by the sequester, both on the Sandy side and but also on the more discretionary spending side, yes. are you looking in this year's budget at 2013 in slowing those items down? Are you uh, proceeding as though they hopefully will still wind up being reimbursed because they'll change the formulas for how those cuts are getting made? Or I mean, you know, what, are you, how, what are you doing, so I guess, in this in FY13? It's something we're still looking at. I don't think that, you know, I would guess that maybe there's an impact in 13, but I would imagine overall, in terms of the stuff that runs through the city budget, it's probably less than $20 million. I don't know that for a fact, quite honestly, because I have a lot of trouble distributing it between 13 and 14. What happens is current services are reimbursed on a pipeline which to a degree is already in place and although there are cuts against the flow in that pipeline, when do you actually um, get less money that's going to mean that you literally don't have the money to pay the person who was providing that service? It takes a while. That's a not, not a very you know, compelling, uh, rational answer, but it's, it's kind of where we're at at the moment. Okay. I mean, you know, part of the good news of the budget process is that by the time of the executive budget proposal and that when we talk about these things again, hopefully we'll, we'll know more and Congress will have come yes. to their senses, although that's a, not a bet that yes. I make today. And, and then, then comes the question, quite honestly, to what extent in terms of our own funding priorities um, are we going to try to um, replace the federal money with our own. And that, of course, is always an extremely uh, nitty problem because, among other things, you want to maintain the pressure for the federal money to maintain the service because if you use the money for what they were doing, that means you're not going to have it for something else. Indeed. All right, so uh, I think for now what you say makes some sense. Obviously, if by the time of the executive budget we're still in something like this place, we'll have to be able to work together to make those, make right. those choices. Um, I want to switch for a minute to uh, following up on some of the discussion around the Sandy funds. Um, and I think the, what you said about how long it's likely to take is, uh, you know, is cause for us to pay attention. I guess what I'd like to ask is, on the side of helping us see it and track it over time for the duration of your time there but also for years to come, there was a big difference in how we were able to see and view the stimulus funds, which I thought your office and others within the, in, within the administration did a great job making visible what was being spent, what was being asked for, what was being reimbursed, how it was being used, and that that was a big improvement on the 9-11 uh, funds. And I guess I would ask, would you commit to us to set something up like that for the Sandy spending so that this long process of seeking uh, spending, seeking reimbursement for and attending to the spending of that four and a half billion dollars can be clear both to the council and to members of the public? Um, we are certainly uh, spending a tremendous amount of time and resources on this exact process of identifying costs, negotiating them through 
FEMA uh, with those uh, work project units. I'm sorry. Project worksheets, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> they make it sound like middle school, do they? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think that um, we're happy to uh, share with you what we're carrying in terms of budget structure for um, those purposes. In some cases, it's reasonably exact at this point, but um, those numbers that I gave you, I mean five and a half billion dollars, we persuaded them of about 580 million at this point. So some of that is simply the time required to negotiate through the details with between our bureaucratic enterprise and theirs. Um, and some of it is that we still don't really know. When somebody asked earlier that, uh, you know, agencies have ongoing spending, are you covering it or is that new? We're covering it, but until you have the spending, you don't know what it is to some degree. So, so I'm speaking more to uh, transparency for the long term. I appreciate that the bureaucratic back and forth yeah, with FEMA is going to be there, but if you could, uh, in the time and with the, what you learned from stimulus, set something up that would allow that to be seen over time. Yeah, I think we can do that. It would be hugely helpful. Mm -hmm. And the, the last thing I'll just add to that, Mr. Chairman, if I can just add a, a little follow-on to this question, is the administration is now engaged in this uh, SIRR process that Seth Pinsky from EDC is leading, which is going to look well beyond this question of sort of reimbursable damage expenses to making choices about what kinds of mostly capital, but perhaps some expense investments as well, are needed to have the city ready in the face of climate change, not just a hurricane like this, but others as well. And as we saw when the state took the sort of throw the spaghetti at the wall approach, I hope the cities will be a little more uh, targeted at helping us think through what investments make sense out of the many that might be there. The mayor's had some to say on this. But I also am curious if you've given some thought to how within the context of the city's capital budget uh, during the remainder of the time that you uh, have, you'll weigh in on what we could afford to spend, whether it makes sense to increase our level of debt service given the need to make those long-term investments, how to weigh risk versus return. Those are big questions and in some ways we can't even start to look at them until we get that SIRR report, but they obviously affect not only this year's budget but the capital plan that we're in and I'd love to have your thoughts on, on how, how the Bloomberg administration expects to approach that. I mean, obviously, um uh, your points are, are important in terms of uh, what's going to be put together. I, I think I am supposed to be briefed on sort of the state of play in that developing program sometime in the next week or two. I, it's, it's very early days, at least certainly in my knowledge of what this proposal is going to be and I would imagine that uh, I mean, yeah, there's, there's clearly a uh, significant budget dimension to this, which ultimately is going to have to, uh, I would imagine, be balanced against everything else we think is important to do as time goes on. I just ask for your help. We don't always have a good framework for thinking about the long-term capital issues and how to weigh spending against need. Um, and it may be in this budget cycle or maybe beyond this budget cycle, but I think it'll be important that the administration and the council can work together to set a framework that helps us make hard and long-term choices. So right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Melinda. Councilmember Coppell will be followed by Councilmember Williams. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you mentioned, so it ob obviously is important, uh, it's $650 million, the taxi sale. The taxi sale contemplates the $650 million, I mean the Six hundred. Budget contemplates what? Six hundred. Six hundred. Six hundred million in the course of 2014 budget. Yes. And there's no more any expectation of getting any money this year. Correct. Right. So, as I understand it, the court case revolves at least 
significantly, if not solely, on the issue of uh, the council giving a home rule message. Is that correct? It has, there are two problems that were identified by the uh, lower court proceeding. One is he said the absence of the home, home rule message was unconstitutional. Two, the way um, the licenses are to be distributed in um, outside of the, so the central business district, uh, which in the authorizing legislation, as I understand it, favors um, recipients who've been in the car service business, basically, the livery business up to now. So there are two problems. The way that bill was structured originally, if anything is wrong with it, the whole thing goes down. It's not separable. So uh, let me ask, has, has the administration made any effort to negotiate with, I suppose it would be both with the state and with us, to try and shortcut this process by uh, passing uh, amended legislation? Has, 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 has that idea been uh, explored? Yes. And at so, length and at the moment it's not looking good. Okay. Well, let, let me just say that, that in my view that should be the approach uh, taken um, and perhaps some other issues could be resolved at the same time uh, in such a negotiation with this body where, which I sit on and it would have to involve the state obviously but mm -hmm. my impression is that if the mayor and the council came to a resolution that the state would probably could could be convinced to, to go along. Um, that's my view and we don't need to debate it but I would urge very strongly and I've urged our leadership here in the council also very strongly to renew efforts to try and solve this um, and other related issues with respect to the yellow taxi fleet and the outer borough uh, plans. I don't understand why more effort has not gone into coming to such a resolution. Um, it's simply beyond me and, and I would urge you to urge those including the Corporation Council to redouble your efforts. It would solve a lot of things and not wait for a court decision which could be adverse and which would require you to do it anyway. Subject and that, as I, I said earlier it's not looking very hopeful at the moment. Well, I regret, I regret to hear that and I've, I've urged our leadership to try and get that thing, those negotiations started. In a similar vein, is there an attempt being made to resolve differences between the uh, administration and the UFT on the uh, teacher evaluation so that at least we could go to Albany and say... Uh, Excuse me, I'm Council Member, this is about the budget. It's not about valuations, it's about the budget. You have a question on the budget. Well, it had, that has a direct effect on the budget. In fact, we've been talking about it uh, this it morning. It has a budget question. It's dealing with the budget. That's not a budget question? I no. think it's a budget question, Mr. Chairman. All right, Chairman. just ask your question for a budget. Thank you. Well, does it seem like you might be able to resolve this impasse over $250 million by coming to an agreement with the union and then going to Albany and say, we did it, give us the money back? I think, I think there have been a lot of public, public statements by various officials on this subject and that I really can't add at this moment. Well, again, similar to the other issue that's tied up in the courts, here again, uh, the failure to negotiate is, a, I think, is a very poor uh, comment on the manner in which these issues are being dealt with right now and it has direct implications on the constituents we all represent. I would think you should, you know, like they do with labor negotiations, get into a room, close the door and say we've got to come out with an agreement. Are you finished, Council Member? Yeah. Okay. Council Member Williams followed by Council Member Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Page. Uh, I uh, missed uh, some of your testimony, so I apologize. And I'm going to have to push you a little bit because apparently I only have five minutes. Uh, but my first question is, uh, my uh, colleague, Councilman Dan Garodnik, and I have put forth some charter revision uh, suggestions and reforms that would uh, help, uh, we think, the budget move smoother. Have you seen any of those? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with it. Well, what, three ones that I think are important. One, uh, moving up the revenue estimate date to May 25th. 
so it can be less politicized. Uh, one was uh, taking away the mayor's ability to impound if the city council uh, passed a budget. And the last one was to uh, make more units of appropriation uh, so that we can understand what's in the budget a little easier. Are any of those things uh, do you think would help this budget conversation that we have every year? I don't. You don't? <laughs> I think that... I'm shocked the, and amazed. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the, uh, the, the, the revenue estimate... Um, at the end of the day, the mayor is the person who is responsible for producing a... Uh, balanced result each year and we've actually done that for you know a long time now and it I think depends on his being able to do the estimate in a manner that is as up-to-date as possible when when it kicks in which is at at budget adoption and I think that the question of impoundment um, is the problem is that circumstances change, the budget amendment process is not terribly um, quick um, or assured and you can't spend money you don't have. And so there's obviously much more to be said and I appreciate your point on, on all of this stuff. That question of more units of appropriation, <coughs> I actually think that one of our problems and one uh, of this body's problems is there is an enormous amount of information all the time about what New York City is doing with its money and, and where it's being spent and so on and so forth. It, I think that the quantity of information is a problem in itself. If we could figure out better how to focus and summarize what was going on, I think that we would serve all of our interests. I don't know how best to do that, but I don't think proliferating the detail is necessarily going to do it for us. I, I only have uh, two more minutes, but I, obviously I disagree, so I'm going to come back to when I say something at the end to that. But the units of appropriation, we still don't get a lot of information, particularly when it comes to education. But uh, do, did, you have, uh, did you talk about any revenue raising options in the budget? I, I haven't. Do we have um, any the only one, I guess the only one I've talked about is yeah, taxi medallions. I don't know if that's a raise or a drop. Um, we talked about FEMA, which I think is actually okay, or, the, or federal reimbursement on Sandy, which I think is okay for the moment. So we, we've only talked uh, about money. We're losing cuts, but no ways to raise revenue. Well, I mean, those are significant amounts of money in both cases. Uh, what would you like to talk about in raising I, I'm asking you if you had... Uh, okay, so my last uh, bunch of questions. Uh, do we know how much money goes to uh, particularly black or Latino communities or poor communities from the budget? Mm -hmm. I think that if you, you know, the, the way you'd figure that out is you probably have to look at, at specific programs and look at, and look at the spending for the program. There's nothing that, and, and I suppose there's, there's some information by community board and things of that kind, um, whether you have divisions, geographic divisions, which would correspond to what you would define as a black and Latino community um, is probably not. So we don't the, have the meat is not going to be good, that good. But I think but we can probably find out a lot of information. Do we think that's about relevant to that. how much uh, money and resources go into that community when we get to the budget? Is that a thought process? There's certainly a thought process in terms of people with needs of all kinds and that overlaps considerably with the people that you're talking about. If I can just, Mr. Chair, get 60 more seconds. Um, the reason I ask is because it's funny to me because when it comes to the police, uh, our response is clear. And the reason we say we do stop question and frisk 
where we put police resources is because we say the problem is in those neighborhoods. So if we can do that for the police, I'm trying to figure out why we can't do that for other resources. We have a way of being able to describe the problem in terms of black, white, and brown, but not the resources to respond to those problems unless it's the NYPD. So there's an impact uh, zones in some of those communities, which I think are fantastic. But why can't we have impact zones when it comes to resources, when it comes to the budget? I think if you actually looked at who draws resources for uh, well, I, I asked you childhood you support to through it. I, th I think that I think that the <coughs> I think if you looked at the way that, uh, at the way money is spent for various services in New York City, it is actually drawn in proportion to the kind of concerns you have. Whether you can do it from the top uh, down, I mean, the thing about I don't know. Well, I think my time is up, but I think uh, top-down would be a perfect approach because we do that when it comes to the police department, so we should okay. do it in the other departments as well. I did want to just end by saying uh, this administration is frustrating me. The Bloomberg administration took a third term, yeah. particularly because they said uh, he had a fiscal creativity. I've seen no fiscal creativity in this term, no fiscal acuity. Anyone can try to break unions. Anyone can cut programs. We can take a first-year uh, fiscal uh, finance student in any community college who graduated from any high school to do what this mayor has did. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Council member. Uh, Could I have a moment to respond to that last statement? Sure. Um, there's a question of where you spend money and if you spend it for one thing you don't spend it for another. Um, this question of uh, collective bargaining settlements. Um, we have not uh, spent money on collective bargaining settlements in the last few years, which has actually meant that there has been more money available for, among other things, all the services that this body is extremely concerned about. The that mayor has shown no fiscal creativity. <coughs> he has cut programs now that he says that are not cut because we have to restore them. I'm saying anyone could have done what he did. There was no reason for him okay. to fiscal acuity that has not been shown. I could break backs of the unions. I can balance the budget on the backs of the New York City. Anybody could do that. I was expecting to see Thank more you. from the mayor who said he needed a third term because of the fiscal crisis. Okay. Council Member Dolly Milley. <laughs> Good morning. I just wanted to ask a few questions about um, city and MTA joint owned assets. The MTA 2010 to 2014 capital program includes the 250 million that would come from disposition of properties. Um, that the MTA jointly owned with the city. Can you provide details of these jointly um, held assets? Um, I, can't, I can't off the top of my head. The issue that they're talking about is that um, for most of the subway system, at least, in New York City, the city actually holds title to the facilities and the MTA operates the uh, transit system under a lease. Um, the lease gives them possession of the property for as long as they're using it for transit purposes. They have to agree that they no longer need to use it for us to get it back and be able to get the value of it. Um, so, that building at J Street is, is one example. And 70 J, I used to work there. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you basically need the MTA and the city to get together because so if there's you, nothing in it for the MTA to admit that they're not using it, they're not going to, in which case the building just sits there. You need some joint benefit that you negotiate. And, um, so I think have the city and the MTA ha um, uh, have an agreement on at least selling some of these assets? I don't think we have an explicit agreement at this point. I think that building on J Street was, was one deal that we managed to put together that I think has made sense um, in, in at least getting a, a, a future use and benefit out of that bu building. And, so uh, who would hold sort of responsibility as um, disposing of these properties since they sit in there vacant? NTA say that they are a cash strap. The city say they cash strap, and some of these buildings can be sold. So no one's having that conversation. I think it's it's an ongoing conversation between the MTA and the city. As a matter of fact. So how would the sale of these assets benefit the city if they did sell a couple of these buildings? I mean, when the city sells real estate, it uh, the proceeds is 
under our accounting principles of revenue. Wouldn't it be able it's something to help we can spend. Someone, I'm sorry? Wouldn't it help some of the gaps that the city is having? Yes. So why no one is thinking about these I think we are. We are, in fact, talking to them. Since 2010. You have to persuade the MTA to determine officially that they no longer have a use for the property in order for the title to revert back to us so that we can sell it. By and large, they're going to do that if you can work out a transaction where they get some advantage and we get some advantage. It takes a while. It takes a while? Yeah. I have another minute. Can I go? Thank you. Councilmember hey. Fiddler. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Page. I'm sorry I wasn't here for your uh, opening testimony. I couldn't be. Uh, and since there's no written testimony, I can't catch up. So I'm reasonably confident that the two things I'm going to ask you about have not been discussed today. Um, Commissioner Richter was uh, before a joint hearing of uh, youth services and general welfare, I think it was last week, uh, and he was talking about the state funding or lack thereof for uh, the uh, Safe Harbor Act. And he made the comment that in the absence of a secure funding stream, it was difficult for the administration to plan programs that, you know, would remain in place. And so the money was being used, the money was being used largely for, um, you know, figuring out what to do if we're lucky enough to get the money. Um, and the, the, the theory being that it's difficult to plan certain services in the absence of certainty of funding. Would you agree with that premise? In general, I mean, it's, it's useful to, uh, all other things being equal, it's useful to know what's going to happen next. Okay. Um, I, I would think that's particularly so where uh, providers are being asked to lease space uh, in order to provide essential services. So uh, I uh, would just make this comment, you know, kind of as my opening salvo on this point. I mean, this is the last uh, time uh, at a budget that you and I will have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to think engage. I think I'm actually supposed to show up after the exec. No, no, no. I mean, uh, on the last, this, I'm sorry, the last budget cycle, the dance is just beginning, <laughs> I understand. Uh, we, we fund at the end of each fiscal year in the executive budget, um, uh, approximately $12 million for services for runaway and homeless youth. Uh, every time the mayor uh, puts out his budget, and I believe in his heart, he believes these services are absolutely necessary, the critical part of the safety net for young people who I don't think the mayor thinks should be sleeping on subway gratings at night. Um, there's only about five and a half of it. Uh, it makes it extraordinarily difficult going forward. Uh, for these providers to stay in the business of providing this safety net, um, would you consider baselining the $12 million for runaway and homeless youth in this year's budget? You know, looked at in isolation, maybe looked at in the context of the pattern of dynamics that we seem to have gotten into over a number of years in how budgets are put together and negotiated between us between now and the end of June, I, I, I don't know. Well, I, I think that pregnant pause was at least some consideration. So. Uh, uh, I, I would just urge, I mean, this is the, the, you know, the final budget uh, for the mayor and with this council. Uh, we've made a tremendous amount of progress on something that uh, is still not where it ought to be, mm -hmm. uh, that we ought to find a way to institutionalize it so that uh, we don't have to worry about it again. And the next council doesn't have to fight with the next mayor over it. It just seems particularly cruel considering the topic. Second uh, question. Um, would you, I, I have been told by officials, both retired and still in the Parks Department, that one of the single largest uh, causes 
of Parks Department capital cost overruns is the Public Design Commission. Do you have an opinion on that? Um, not for here. <laughs> oh, Mr. Page, I think that's the best answer you've given me in 12 years. Um, and, and honestly, I think it speaks for itself. And, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about finding ways to uh, reform the governmental process, make it more transparent, make it more accountable, not waste money that ought not be wasted, I think we ought to get to the Public Design Commission and figure out a way to get that done. I don't think that the Public Design Commission has any greater knowledge about what's artsy than the, than the designers at the Parks Department and, and uh, some of the examples that uh, I, could, I could bring to your attention, you may already know, are just outrageous. So uh, I thank you for your candor. Are you finished, Mr. Fiddler? Well, it wasn't that bad. You're smiling, Mr. Page. Uh, <laughs> so, <clears throat> I have a, f uh, a few questions. You testified earlier that HHC lost some revenue from the closed hospitals. Yeah. Uh, so you're talking about Coney Island Hospital and Bellevue? Uh, Coney Island, Bellevue, and uh, Gold Goldwater. Goldwater. And how much did you lose at each hospital? I don't, I don't know. The number I have in my head is something in the neighborhood of 200 million overall. 200 million overall. Could we have a breakdown? Um, you know, we'll send you. I think, a I think we letter. can probably we can get you that. Yeah, I'm curious to know how much since Coney Island Hospitals uh, is in my district. Um, I have a capital question to ask you. Um, the um, capital commitment plan has a, two commitment figures the total commitment and the commitment plan. The first figure includes all the projects that agencies are authorized to move forward during the year, while the second figure represents a target level of commitment that is lower. The total authorized preliminary plan for fiscal 2013 is 19 billion, which exceeds the target level of 14 billion by $5 billion. Why is that? And why is the target lower than what is authorized? I don't know. This is a practice that um, has been around for a long time. And what it reflects is that things come up in carrying out uh, capital work that I would say almost invariably cause it to take longer than you thought it was going to as opposed to varying equally that something might happen faster than you thought it was going to. And what we have found is that as a practical matter, if you think you can sustain a program of X, you have to have an authorized pool of X plus. And the target is basically the X that we think we can sustain. It's what we build our borrowing and debt service cost plans off. And the authorized level is, we'll get to it, but um, we don't expect that overall agencies will hit out at that level. Every now and then an agency does hit out at its authorized yeah, I'm level. Sorry, why is the target level, level so much lower? You know what I mean? Because of our experience in terms of the amount of authorized programs that agencies actually get to in a given year. All right. You know, during the last couple of years, uh, the total authorized capital commitments have uh, exceeded the commitment plan. Mm -hmm. But even so, agencies have fallen short of their, commit, of their commitment plan targets, and we have huge unrealized commitments that we have rolled into the subsequent year. Uh, do you anticipate rolling $5 billion into future years at the end of 2013? $5 billion, what is the scope? I I, something in that neighborhood, yes. So you plan on rolling $5 billion over? Plan? I mean, plan suggests that I want to. Um, I guess it's, it's just an observation of how 
this enterprise seems to work, that I think that that's in the neighborhood right. of the number we think is likely to roll? Well, there's something we should talk about because maybe there should be some, some more rescindments in this whole issue. That one, I'll look you smiling over there. <laughs> that, it, but really, I mean, this is a large possible. number. We should really sit down and talk about it, you know what I mean? Um, and there are many issues with the capital plan that we have to discuss. All right, Council Member Jackson has lots of questions on education. We'll give him an opportunity to follow up since he's the chair of that wonderful committee. If any other council member would like to ask follow up questions, uh, give your name to uh, my uh, attorney, Tanisha Edwards. Council Member Jackson will be followed by Council Member Landa, then Mealy. Well, <coughs> thank you, Chair Recchia. Uh, Director Page, let me focus back on education. Uh, my understanding is after extraordinary growth in preschool special education spending, the orders conducted by the Office of State Controller reveals fraud and, and inaccuracies within the system, including overbilling by preschool providers. And what is being done by this administration, by OMB or whatever the other agencies, to monitoring the spending on preschool special ed and contract schools? and other contractual spending that may be susceptible to overbilling and fraudulent activity. And, you know, what is your I role th I in think, that? I opinion? think that that's a level of agency management that OMB basically isn't equipped on its own to carry out. It's obviously a very basic concern. When people are cheating on billing, it means you're not getting value for the money. And we are institutionally, and I personally am very interested in what value you can get for the money you're spending. But at the level of contract and performance that you're talking about, um, it's the agency? You need to ask the agency. More okay, so that's DOE. Because I can't do it, yeah. Okay. And, and I think that that's what I wanted to know. Is there uh, any unit within your office that really looks into that, or you expect the agencies in their oversight of the contracts that they provide to, to look into that? Okay. So let me talk about uh, uh, capital, if, if you don't mind. Um, uh, we had a hearing with the Department of Education, I think it was just last week, um, about uh, the impact of Hurricane Superstorm Sandy on the Department of Education. <clears throat> uh, and I heard you talked about, you know, capital will probably take several years, three or four years, in order to finally get what we're going to get. But they told us that at this point in time, only one school had been um, in with FEMA to really look at the, and assess the situation. Do you have any insight on why is it taking so long to uh, look at all of the schools uh, that have been negatively impacted by Hurricane Superstorm Sandy and whether or not your office, the Office of Management and Budget, are you involved in that or are you leaving that specifically to the agency, in this case DOE? One second. Okay. Um. As I understand it, they've, they've looked at eight, and they are um, looking to uh, get at a much broader number of schools than that. They, it's uh, FEMA, it's the state body that um, FEMA runs, th money from the feds through FEMA actually comes through the state of New York to us. It's a combination of FEMA, the State of New York, the School Construction Authority, and the sort of detailed engineering understanding of what's going on in the school, which is the School Construction Authority's particular responsibility. We are very much involved in the um, 
making the teamwork happen between the various parties as, as an, an OMB role here along with trying to keep track of the money uh, in the FEMA process and this one is being pushed down the pike. It's elaborate and complicated and it goes beyond, I mean, when you start getting into the engineering of this, um, if you have a, a building that's been flooded and then you, you manage to get it back online and working, um, that's actually not the end of the engineering story. If you had salt water in the cellar and you soaked everything, even when you dry it out, there are all kinds of questions about what happens next and how long it lasts and what you're going to do about it. And it gets to be a very nitty, detailed engineering analysis that has to happen school by school. And it is something that we are very actively pursuing. Uh, and and I, I hear you, and, and believe me, I understand, but what I'm gathering from your response is the details of all of that are being done by FEMA with the state, with SCA, and with DOE, and those engineers, and basically there's general, general oversight by OMB, especially with the amount of money that is being allocated or approved for spending, so forth and so on. That's what I'm hearing. We actually have a contract with a, an engineering firm that is expert in uh, sort of FEMA reimbursement issues and has engineering staff. Mm -hmm. uh, they're called Haggerty, with price. Haggerty Consulting. Um, and we use them to augment the professional staff on these jobs to push people in to. Uh, push it along so that we actually have um, that professional resource role as well in this process. Okay. The, and uh, Director, uh, uh, we had a hearing last Monday or something like that with DOE and they responded to us at that time, only about a week ago, that only one school had been inspected with FEMA. And so and when you're telling me eight, when you're telling me eight, then it would seem as though, when you're telling me I'm, eight, I'm, being, I'm being told that the question was okay. how many in Rekia's district. There was one in Rekia's district, but there are seven more not in Rekia's district, which is what got confused apparently in that, in that dialogue. Okay. So when you, when you were saying one in Dominic Reckia's district, I don't remember that being said, but be, be as it may. Um, but it's what eight. I, what it's I, eight, which is not the end of the story. Right. No, I understand. I, but uh, my understanding, and Regina Perita Ryan, our assistant director, indicated that only one project worksheet, meaning I guess the details of it, has been submitted already. That might be, because those things, first of all, you have to figure out what you want. And then you have to spend a lot of nitty time with FEMA personnel getting them to agree on all the detailed specifications of the particular job. That was that, that number that I was putting out. You know, we think we've got four and a half billion and we've got 577 in project worksheets. I mean, it's ongoing. Okay, well, what, what I guess what Overall, when there's so many schools that were damaged, we, uh, the people, and I guess you, don't want to take two years to examine all of the schools and submit the project worksheets. And that's I, th I think, which is, which is definitely a point. I mean, the other thing that happens, though, in terms of getting work done in schools, I mean, this is going to come into the usual problem that you know, there's a certain amount of work you can do when the kids are in the school mm -hmm. and a certain amount that you can't do when the kids are in the school and there's a certain capacity in the business to actually get this stuff done and you need to cram your need and having identified the need through the window that you can get open in terms of getting the job done. So I agree with you that you don't want schools to be in a condition that's bad because of storm damage. 
it, um, you know, like everything else, it's a process. Do you, do you see, um, as a result of, of Superstorm uh, Sandy, uh, do you expect to see an adjustment in the five-year capital plan uh, as a result of this? Or yeah, there, I think it's already, yes, I do, um, because it's going to have to encompass the capital work driven by uh, Sandy, that's probably in the short term going to have some effect on the baseline capital work that you think you can realistically get done in this period. I'm sure the total is going to move up, but what it does to the scheduling of the baseline work when you have more, more urgent stuff to repair damage, I'm sure there's going to be some tension between those two pieces of, of the next iteration of their capital plan. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Council Member. It'll be Council Member Alvan, then Council Member Rodriguez, and then it'll be Lander and Mealy. Council Member Alvan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Sandy, I, I believe, uh, Mr. Page, that in your opening uh, presentation you mentioned uh, the possibility of, of using CSBG, Community Service Block Grant? CDBG, or, Community Development, Development Block, Block Grant money. Yeah. Okay, same, same concern. Um, generally, how much federal money do we usually get under the CDBG, and how much do you anticipate uh, would be uh, prioritized to deal with Santa recovery? I think our, our normal CDBG bu budget year after year is $200, $250 million, something along those lines. Um, the, we're, the, in theory, New York City is going to get three installments of CDBG money driving off Sandy. Um, we got the first one, which was 1.77 billion. That's supposed to be roughly a third of the total we're going to get. Um, and. Some of it is, is going for uh, the sort of baseline filling in around the FEMA reimbursement on the four and a half billion dollars, which is the number we estimate we need for repairing the schools, the streets, the uh, sewage treatment plants, so on and so forth as a result of Sandy. Some of it is going to go um, for sort of more broadly planned um, improvements in uh, housing and city infrastructure to make us more resistant to uh, this kind of risk in the future. Uh, that's what people were talking about earlier as this, um, uh, the effort that's being led by Seth Pinsky and there's a, uh, a housing specific effort being led by, I guess, uh, Brad Gare and uh, HPD in the sort of housing side of New York City. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> this money, is it about the same amount or is, this, uh, is there an additional allocation coming to CDBG? It's, it's major addition. I mean the base amount is like 200, 250 million. That this remains is, And this is 1.7 billion on top of that. Oh, okay. Additional. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the second inquiry is um, uh, the mayor, unlike most mayors uh, in big cities, uh, many years ago indicated, uh, acknowledged that poverty was a significant problem in our city, and indeed in every large city. And I was uh, really gratified because he decided that he would engage a poverty in our city and indeed uh, try to reduce poverty in our city. You may read. Remember, he created, I think it was the CNED first, Center for Economic Neighborhood something. It was a neighborhood approach uh, to try and, and reduce poverty. Uh, that lasts for a little while. And that went out, and then he, uh, he set up this committee of experts who recommended the Center for Economic Opportunity, I believe, who primarily, I think, was to uh, patent, model, interventions that, to see if they would work again in reducing poverty so forth. And, and it, they still exist as I understand it. Uh, in your knowledge, have we reduced poverty in our city or have we found out how we should go about reducing poverty in our city? Because poverty has become like an unspoken word 
<laughs> around the nation. Uh, you would think there are no poor people in our cities because no one is really addressing uh, poverty. Uh, and to his credit, he did say he would take it on, but perhaps to his discredit, I don't know of any significant uh, reduction that has occurred or any avenue to reducing poverty. Would you want to comment on that, sir? I, you know, I think that the considerable effort has been uh, made on this front. Um, the uh, recent recession has not helped in terms of the statistics on poverty here or anywhere else, really. I think that. Uh, I, I, I don't think that anyone has come up with the um, effective single answer to how to deal with poverty and all of the problems that go with it. I think that the mayor, uh, I think part of the driver, driver behind the mayor's interest in education in New York City is that he believes that that is one major important piece to enable people to um, move themselves up and do better. Um, you know, when you, when you think about poverty statistics, I mean, you could fix it by, if you took everybody who was below whatever your threshold was and sent them all a check to bring them over. But, you know, where do you get the money for it and what happens then and is that really what you meant or are you trying to set up a place where people's efforts are rewarded and they're enabled to get themselves out of it? Um, as I say, I mean, you look around and uh, it seems to be a constant problem. I mean, the whole, you know, it's been mentioned earlier this morning, but it's mentioned all the time. Whenever you think about this stuff, the problem of distribution of wealth, who has it, who doesn't, why, how, how can you go about fixing that without um, causing the kind of overall wealth and the effectiveness of how people are behaving and doing business and producing things to go down? Uh, lots of people think about these issues a lot, and um, I think that's what you hope is going to happen because if you judge it on having the right answer, I, I, it's hard to know what that is. If I might just follow up with that. Uh, I agree with a lot, a lot of what you said, but beyond the statistics and beyond the redistribution of wealth, which are two major uh, issues, there is the underlying reality of uh, poor people and we know where they are. You know, we know the neighborhoods uh, where you find most uh, poor people. So I guess I'm asking a professional opinion on this. In as much as we can identify the areas in our city uh, that are impoverished, uh, would you and therefore the mayor be in favor of whatever approach, avenue to deal with that neighborhood approach to be able to coordinate city agencies to focus on the areas where the poverty is. I mean, we rob banks because that's where the money is. So this is where poor people are. Why can't we organize ourselves and address those neighborhoods, if you will, where people are most impoverished? Is that a, a good way to go, in your opinion, good approach? One thing you said, which was, if I think it's a good idea, the mayor thinks it's a good idea. One thing you said was that if I think it's a good idea, the mayor will think it's a good idea. That doesn't necessarily always follow. Um, he's the mayor, I'm not. Um, you know, it was, it was, I guess, brought up by Mr. Williams earlier that if, the, if you can target the high crime neighborhood and you can put police resources into it, why can't you do the same thing for poverty? And I think that we do somewhat. I think that the... Um, the nurse family partnership thing that uh, Linda Gibbs was, has been working on from time to time, I think is actually um, 
geographically distributed as to neighborhoods that, that seem would that should benefit most from this kind of service. That kind of thing happens. This question of actually taking a specific neighborhood and doing a comprehensive approach to what you can do in that neighborhood to change it, not just crime or what have you. I mean, to me, that it's, it, it's an interesting idea. I think we do it, in fact, because of the way services are drawn by people who need them in this town. I'm not sure we do it in the way you're thinking of, which is you'd identify the area and see what you could, from top down, figure out what to do. I'm, I mean, it's an interesting thing to, to think about. Okay. Councilmember Rodriguez, then be followed by Lander and Mealy. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Mark, uh, as you know, I chair the Committee of Higher Education, and uh, a concern that I always have is about CUNY. Is CUNY getting all the support in need in order to graduate our students? I'm sure if you ask CUNY that question, they will say definitely not. We need more, and why aren't you delivering more to us? And they would say the same thing to me, frankly. Um, I think they are in this budget at their uh, statutory maintenance of effort level from, of support from New York City. Um, I think like any enterprise that's trying to produce a service, um, they would always tell you if you give us more resources, we'll do, do a better job. But what about, there's two programs. First of all, our reality in the city that you know close to 60% of our New York City public school graduated. Uh, it's using the major number. I would say 50%, but there's, if they look at different cohorts, they, the city has said that close to 60% of New York City graduated. And those who graduated, as you also know, and I think that the whole city really understand and agree, that 89% of those getting into community college need remedial courses. And 26% graduate from community college after six years. In the city, and this is the men and women that represent the workforce of the future, unless our approach is that we will continue getting the best knowledge of person from uh, different countries, and we, and we can go out to Asia, Europe, Latin America, and, and graduate and identify, like, you know, the best of the best and attract those people to come here. But we have to be, I think, more responsible and plan with our human resources. So I think that everyone, including the mayor, realize that there's a big challenge that we have yeah. on retention from our colleges. There's two programs that we know that you make a difference. ASAP and College Now. ASAP is the program that students are identified at the, at the high school level and we provide, sorry, College Now. College Now is a program that we identify the student and we give them the opportunity to take classes at the CUNY colleges or CUNY go to the different high school and provide a support that make a difference for the students to increase the graduation percentage. Then we have ASAP, and with a, with a new community college, every single student will have more support, extra support, and we are committed to graduate all of them. So how the city make, how the administration make an assessment on how much it will take if we provide every single student in a high school that in ninth grade we already has identified as a student that they would need more support to graduate three years after from high school. And there's a program called College Now that make a difference. As we make the assessment and increase the investment for the College Now and the same thing for the ASAP program, how the administration look how much it will take 
I don't know. I guess that you can you can multiply the number of people in in the ninth grade by how much we're spending per person in these programs. But what you're really saying to me is, I mean, it's not a special program. It's something that you're supposed to be that ideally you would be providing as a part of your high school education um, for anybody who was there and and seemed to need it. I mean, there's a constant question and, and as to how to, you know, how do you educate people? How do you, and it's, it's partly, you know, how good the teacher is, how well trained the teacher is. It's how, it's also how well, how, how motivated is the kid? I mean, is, do they go home at night and, and feel secure and have a parent who asks them, you know, why they're not doing their homework? Or do they have to deal with all kinds of other things? Um, it's a very complicated and elaborate question and it's not just that you're going to fix it by writing a check to one of these programs, I, I, I think, although maybe, maybe that's the answer. You justify the money and you, you get it. I don't know. Well, there's those two programs has proven in the city that make a difference. Mm -hmm. It make a difference. So mm -hmm. if we don't do the intervention in the, at the high school level, when we have a college now program that make a difference, then what we are saying is that after we invest 150,000 people in a New York City high school, they are not college material. So those programs are making the difference. On the, in the ASAP program, is the same thing. It's making a difference. The number is there. CUNY is saying, the city is saying, those two programs make a difference. Uh, my second question is on... Council Member, you have to, your time is up. Can you give me five, ten seconds? A, a quick question. I took a, a, a paternity leave when my daughter was born at the end of June, in January. Only Chicago has a paid family maternity leave. Has a city make an assessment on how much it will take if we provide paid family maternity leave to our city employee. Councilmember, this is a hearing based on the budget that was presented by the mayor. This is a, a specific question about the budget. Uh, Mr. Page, if you want to Well, answer. I'm sorry. I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer. It's certainly it, it, it's a, an answer that, I mean, one, one could figure it out. And okay. But I, I don't know what the well, it's not including the budget, and I think it's, no. it's a fair to, for us to say if we, the city has made the assessment, because I think that we as a city should not be behind Chicago when they have a program and we don't have it here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll be joined by Council Member Brewer, Otto, Ignacio, and Gentili. Uh, will Council Member Otto has a question, I believe. If any of the new council members have a question, please let me know. Go ahead, Council Member I Jimmy Otto. apologize for being late. Council Member Ignizio and I were um, at a press conference with Senator Schumer about Sandy-related stuff. Mark, I, I just have one question. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to do the uncontrollable thing that we always do. So I, I just want to give you the same opportunity I gave Commissioner Frankel last week, and that is to publicly uh, end a rumor that has um, abounded in this building from time to time. We had a hearing last week on the property tax assessments, and the, uh, the rumor is that uh, OMB comes up with a dollar amount and what it needs each year from the property tax, and it somehow subliminally, overtly, covertly uh, passes that number along to DOF and finance figures out how to, the, the, how to trigger the assessments to, ref, uh, to generate that money. So I would just give you a chance to okay. do the same thing uh, Commissioner Frankel did last week. Okay. We don't. But, you know, the fact of the matter is we're in the business of forecasting. I mean, we do four-year financial plans. We've got five years because we've got this year and the next four since January. And we're forever trying to figure out what is going to happen. What's going to happen in the economy in general, retail sales, the finance industry, banking, all this stuff, because at the end of the day, it translates back into our tax structure, and that's what 
gives us some kind of forecast of the resources we're going to have to spend. And we are in the business of trying to lay that out for the future all the time. We carry a number in our financial plan for what we think the property tax revenue is going to be over each year of our financial plan. Sadly, or in this case, maybe just as well, I mean, just because we're carrying a forecast number doesn't drive the number. I put in a number for what the bank tax is going to be in each year for the next four years. If by putting in the number I could collect the tax, I would be very happy because I could just run the number. I can't. And it's no more true of the tax assessment process that goes on in New York City. The finance department reviews the circumstances of thousands and thousands and thousands of buildings every year as they go through their assessment problem process. The, you know, they come up with a number at the end of the day, often it's a problem, that's true, um, and you run the rate on it and I figure that that's what I'm going to have as a property tax revenue. But quite honestly, the, the forecast I carry out there in the plan is no more a directive that controls what the Department of Finance does than my forecast of the bank tax controls what Citibank does. I appreciate Thank the you. response. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Vincent Ignizio. Does any other council member have any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, uh, Mark, um, I wanted to talk to you about Sandy related uh, allocations. I saw $861 million was what's reimbursable. Are we going to have continuous um, allocations that we fund throughout the next fiscal year, which also will be eligible for reimbursement, or will it be more we anticipate money coming? from the feds now that we have the bill passed from the feds to the state to the city to fill the needs that we may have uh, for Sandy. Well, I mean, we we have this four and a half billion dollars that we've been saying for quite some time we think is sort of the the, the size of the whole thing in terms of the cost of repairing the damage from Sandy for public facilities in New York City. And that includes the 861 within that four or no? I don't, I, I haven't got the 861 number. Do you know what that oh. is? Uh, what I've got is of that four and a half billion dollars, as of the end of last week, we had about 580 million dollars project worksheets which means that they've been negotiated through with FEMA and they've agreed that yes, this particular unit we've agreed upon, we think it's going to cost this much money and in principle we say yes. Then they take it off to Washington and it runs through another six filters. But at the end of the day, that's fairly realistic. We've got about $580 million of that. They have agreed that's sort of the plan, then you have to spend the money for them to give you the money. It's all reimbursement. Of that 580, they've agreed, you've spent it, we owe it to you, about $322 million. And we've actually collected $238 million. That $4.5 billion, we haven't spent it all by any means. Um, a lot of it there's like a billion six that's expense money. We've spent a lot of that because that was the immediate response of overtime, cleaning up the mess, getting rid of the debris, so on and so forth. But the three something that gets you up to the five and a half, a lot of that is capital. And we know we have damage. We're, we are ongoing developing the details of what the damage is. And then you know, you scope out the work, you bid the contract, you get somebody to come in and say, I'm going to charge you X to fix it. You run that through the FEMA mill in terms of persuading them that, yeah, this is legit and you guys should be paying for it. And then you, you get this project work order thing in, goes through the whole thing. And then 
at this moment, even if they're paying you for it, they agree on everything, they're paying three quarters of it, they're not paying all of it. Eventually that 75 we think is going to pretty automatically go to 90 because when we get to 2.6 billion dollars of damage in this region that they've agreed is legit and reimbursable, that percentage of reimbursement goes to 90. Um, capital work, they'll, they'll give you money for the first half, then they won't give you any money until you finish the job. So if it takes you four years to rebuild the building or whatever it is, um, you're not going to get the second half until the back end. How, how does do that we complicate carry that, your budgeting? How do we carry that as cash? Yes. As a budget matter, right now, all the spending we're doing for Sandy remediation I am balancing with a receivable from the feds. Okay. I'm saying we may not have it yet, but I think I'm going to get it. I don't know how long I'm going to be able to hold on to that. You've got FEMA. At best, it's 90%. So you've still got that 10% piece. Then the feds appropriated, it's a couple of months ago now, uh, a bunch of community development block grant money, which is, has its own requirements you have to meet, but is very likely available to fill in a substantial amount of the portion on the given project that FEMA left out. Right. So I'm still carrying that I've got a receivable that's as big as the spending. As time goes on, there's going to be breakage here and stuff that falls out, but I don't know what it is. And politically, I imagine we're going to continue to be begging the feds to make it available to us, so we really don't want to drop it out. But there's nothing that we're doing on Sandy remediation, which is displacing, which is taking away money from what we are otherwise doing for current city services at this point. Okay. It's all riding on this expectation that the feds are ultimately going to pay for it. I, don't, I suspect there's going to be some breakage, but we're not going there now. Thank you. And the public should know what an enormous job that is because Councilman Murado and I have visited New Orleans and uh, they had a very difficult time working their reimbursables through the feds. It's they hired hundreds deal. of people, which we clearly have not done, and, and to, your, you know, to your credit, uh, and they still are having issues getting their money back that they were promised from Katrina even now, long after. So uh, it's a long process. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Council Member. We've also been joined by Council Member Dan Halloran. All right. Does any other Council Member have any more questions? Uh, you have a question? Okay. Yeah, this will be the last question, then we're going to close it down. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to lead with uh, your, just your final statement over there. I think I'm going to get it, so I'm going to carry it. Um, has the city, or your office in particular, looked at the accuracy uh, over the past 12 fiscal cycles in the projections that you've given in terms of what you've expected versus what's actually come about um, uh, to gauge the likelihood of your projections being accurate? And in particular, uh, have you as an agency uh, acro across the boards looked at the city's overtime budget, um, particularly fire, police, corrections, and sanitation, which totals over $1 billion in overtime expenditures versus the massive headcount reductions that have occurred in those agencies to look at making up the shortfalls? And the I know it's a two-part thing. The first is how accurate have you been in your projections? Um, I believe I, I asked you the same question Councilmember Ignizio did back when you presented the mayor's budget analysis where you talked about FEMA money and I asked you uh, a similar question in the vein of will we ever really see that money given everything and I'm glad that Councilmember Ignizio followed up with it. But um, how accurate have you been uh, as the budget director uh, in these projections that you have made year after year to us uh, considering the fact that I know in the three years that I've been in the council I've come back for peg cuts every year so I guess you haven't been all that accurate ha have you Mr. Budget Director? Much of what <clears throat> the peg cuts have generally been required because I was forecasting that we did already that we didn't have enough money to cover the expenses that we were going to incur if we didn't do something about it. Um, forecasts, budgets, financial plans are by definition creatures looking forward. Um, 
We do our best to forecast what we're going to need and what we're going to take in. We watch what we're doing as we go along and see what actually happens. I, one way of, look, of answering your question is that since 1982, New York City has had balanced operating results in its finances every year as determined on the basis of an outside audit reporting on current expenses and current revenues in the period looking backwards. So the result has actually been pretty consistent and pretty good. That's been true in my tenure as budget director as well as the tenure of a bunch of other people who are doing the job. In terms of are you exactly right looking forward? No. The way you achieve that result is by constantly updating what you think is going to happen in the light of what you understand to be happening at any given moment and trying to adjust your spending, your resources, your timing so that you can make the thing come out. Well, I appreciate that and I know there's uh, very little time but I, I will say that once upon a time my father sat in that chair uh, as an assistant uh, budget director in the Koch administration. And it was because of the fiscal improprieties of the city that we wound up with a balanced, balanced budget requirement that went into effect. And so in from 1982 on, the reason that we had the correct and successful outcomes was because we are mandated by law to have that balanced budget and have those books uh, arrive at the same place that our spending is. Uh, and that is part of the reason we find ourselves each and every year scrambling to fill in the gaps as a budget continues to increase in size despite the fact that our revenue doesn't ever seem to quite meet the expectations of prognosticators like yourself in looking forward. That's not true actually. Sometimes it comes in better. And by the way, I worked with your father. I, he, I had great regard for him. And I appreciate that. Thanks very much. We learn something new every day. <laughs> very impressive. Okay. Is there any other council member? Gail Brewer, you have anything to say? Besides that, you went to kindergarten I, with my page? I like the budget director. I, we, <laughs> <laughs> she likes the budget director. They went to kindergarten together. Or uh, whatever school, went in some school together. Okay, Mr. Page, we are going to take a little recess. We're going to, at 1245, we're going to start with contracts, and then we'll finish up, all right? Okay. So we're going to take a little recess, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. All right.